So sex has been around for a while, and so has having it with randoms you meet at parties. And just as today people are fairly keen to avoid pregnancy, so were people in the past. And in the absence of desire for abstinence, people turn, just like they do now, to birth control. But latex condoms and morning after pills didn't just appear out of nowhere, historical people had to make do with what they had then. And just as birth control methods haven't always been the same, the debate around birth control hasn't remained static either. So let's talk about the evolution of that debate before we get into the specifics of the methods of birth control. Part 1. The Ethics of Birth Control This isn't a sermon, and I'm not going to debate whether birth control is right or wrong here, that's not the purpose of this video, but we are going to have a look at the history of the debate which has been going on for a long time. In the 5th century BC, Hippocrates created his famous Hippocratic Oath. In it, he discussed abortive pessaries, which are a specific type of birth control, and he specifically forbade their use. His oath reads, I will not give a lethal drug to anyone if I am asked, nor will I advise such a plan, and similarly I will not give a woman a pessary to cause an abortion. Initially, physicians read this as a prescription against just the giving of abortive pessaries, which were pieces of wool or linen soaked in some form of medication designed to induce abortions. They did not read it as a blanket ban against abortion, and from the 5th century BC until the 1st century AD, physicians largely continued to administer oral abortifacients and contraceptives to women who wished for them, so long as what they were administering did not specifically come under the heading of an abortive pessary. After this period, however, Scribonius Lager a Roman physician, interpreted Hippocrates' words as if they were a blanket ban on all forms of abortion, and gradually other physicians agreed with him. This was not, however, how the oath had been interpreted previous to this, and both Plato and Aristotle had approved of and encouraged population control by the method of inducing abortion before sense and life had begun in the embryo. Contrastingly, Hebrew religious law proclaimed that women were not pregnant until 40 days after they conceived, and believed that the religious command to be fruitful and multiply applied only to men and not to the women who had to undergo pregnancy, childbirth and child rearing, and thus the women were excused from any such imperative. Back in the early Christian church, however, a few key figures believed that abortion and contraception were condemnable, but others believed that so long as what was brought forth was unformed, it didn't have a soul and therefore killing it was not equal to homicide. By the 7th century, the Catholic Church had instituted capital punishment for those who had abortions, although their definition of abortion was slightly different to ours, as it did not necessarily include what we would think of as early abortions. It was generally believed that a fetus didn't have a soul from conception, and thus having an early abortion during that period was not considered equal to murder. And later religious figures, including St. Hildegard of Bingen and a cleric called Peter, who may or may not have also been Pope John XXI, wrote of plants that could be used as effective abortifacients in the 12th and 13th centuries. Although that doesn't actually necessarily mean they approved of abortion. We know St. Hildegard, for example, definitely didn't, but the fact that they were willing to actively make their readers aware of such a plant may indicate some acknowledgement of the commonality of the practice. Abortion was subsequently made punishable by death in England in 1524, Germany in 1531, France in 1562, and Russia in 1649. But with the advent of the Industrial Revolution came a revocation of those death penalties for birth control, and they were generally replaced with other penalties like imprisonments or fines. And eventually the 20th century saw abortion laws being completely overturned, with abortion becoming legalised in more situations. And even today more countries are reviewing their laws on abortion. On the 22nd of July 2019, the Northern Ireland Executive Formation Bill repealed abortion offences in Northern Ireland. So, if anything can be said of the views of the use of abortifacients and contraceptives throughout time, it's that the same arguments for and against have been circulating for ages. Where once we asked when an embryo gains a soul, now we ask when it becomes a person. Along with this, popular opinion on the subject has shifted backwards and forwards repeatedly. In order to know where on the spectrum of social viability and legality birth control falls in any given era that you're interested in, it is best to research it specifically, because historical views on the subject have been so erratic both in time and geography. As have the methods, which leads us to part 2. Condoms, 13,000 BC to present. Some historians have suggested that carvings dating from around 13,000 BC found in the French Grotte de Combrelles cave represent a figure wearing a prehistoric condom. This is unlikely. 
Moving just a little bit into recorded history, King Minos, the ruler of Knossos, was said to have had serpents and scorpions in his semen, and when his mistresses died after having intercourse with him, he began to insert the bladder of a goat into the vaginas of his sexual partners. This was around 3000 BC, making this the first written record of the use of a female condom, but it was technically more of a form of STI prevention than actual birth control, and the whole thing is largely based on myth, so it's probably untrue. What we're more sure of, though, is paintings in Egyptian temples dating from around 1000 BC that seem to indicate that the Egyptians were wearing condoms made from linen of different colours. It's likely that these condoms were also being used to prevent the transmission of tropical diseases like Bilhazia, and the different colours were probably also symbols of status in the social hierarchies of ancient Egyptian societies. The Romans too used the bladders and intestines of animals, usually sheep or goats, as well as linen as condoms, but this again had more to do with their eagerness to prevent the spread of venereal diseases and their acknowledgement of the contraceptive features of condoms. It doesn't actually appear that the Romans were even aware that condoms could be used as contraceptives, and they used other forms of birth control for that purpose, but we'll get onto that later. In China, sheaths were fashioned from silk paper and an oil lubrication was applied. These became more common as disease and plague spread across Asia from Central Europe, and in Japan, the kabutagata, a tortoise shell, was used to cover the glands of the penis. It was also used to help with erectile dysfunction, and probably wasn't very comfortable. In the 16th century, we know from the writing of Gabrielle Fallopio that sheaths made from lamb and goat intestines were being crafted by butchers and used as condoms to prevent the spread of disease across Europe. They were often soaked in a solution thought to stop the spread of disease, and during the English Civil War, condoms made from the intestines of fish, cattle and sheep were made available to the army of King Charles I as a way of preventing the spread of syphilis. We actually have a 16th century condom, so we know what they would have looked like, and the differences from today's condoms are fairly obvious obvious, and perhaps the starkest of these is that instead of being disposable, they were just cleaned and reused. By the 17th century, condoms are finally well documented as being used as a contraceptive, and King Charles II's physician, a man known as Colonel Condom, prescribed the use of a condom to prevent the conception of any illegitimate children by the king. In 1785, a dictionary on the vernacular language used around London lists the word condom, and it seems to become the official term around that time. Brothels began to sell them to customers, and by the late in the late 18th century, they began to be sold wholesale as a warehouse was opened in the Strand in London by a woman known as Mrs. Phillips. Linen condoms were less comfortable than those made of animal intestines, and as such they fell out of use by the 19th century. It was only during this period that condoms began to be used by people other than the affluent of society, as the working classes tend to lack knowledge of venereal diseases, and they also didn't even have the resources to acquire condoms. By 1860, rubber condoms had begun to be mass produced. They were cheaper and reusable, and whilst condoms made from intestines or bladders were apparently more comfortable, they became outdated by the end of the 19th century. By the 1920s, latex condoms were available. This hugely increased the tensile strength of condoms, and they were later lubricated with spermicide and flavoured, becoming popular in America and Europe in the late 1940s. They also received another boost in popularity after the discovery of AIDS in the 1980s. So what can be said of the story of condoms? Primarily, they have been used to control the spread of venereal diseases throughout time rather than being used as birth control. They have likely been used for at least 4,000 years, if not more, and in the past four centuries, they have occasionally been distributed to armies to prevent the spread of venereal diseases. They have been made of linen, animal intestines, primarily sheep and goat, rubber and latex, as well as a specific type of plant by the Yucas tribe, which inhabited New Guinea. And finally, until the 19th century, they were primarily used by the more affluent members of society, until greater sexual education for the working classes and more affordable condoms came about. So, if most people in the past weren't using condoms to prevent unwanted forays into parenthood, what were they using? Part 3 plant-based contraceptives and abortifacients. Whilst condoms may not have been thought of or used as birth control, the ancient world definitely knew of plants which they used for that purpose. Papyri from ancient Egypt between 1900 to 1500 BC discusses the use of acacia gum and dates, as well as another unidentified plant to stop pregnancy in the first, second, or third trimester. They were mixed with plant fibre and honey to form a pessary, yeah, one of those aborted pessaries that Hippocrates was on about, and studies have shown that acacia is spermaticidal and is used in modern contraceptive jellies, so it would have been effective to some extent. In ancient Greece, from around the 7th century BC to the 1st century AD, silphium was cultivated in Cyrene, a coastal city in what is now modern-day Libya. The plant was apparently an effective contraceptive. 
It was so effective that it was also incredibly lucrative, and by Emperor Nero's time it had almost been harvested beyond recovery, and is now extinct. Sylphium was a member of the giant fennel species, and research on other giant fennels has found that they are effective for use as birth control, so it is likely that Sylphium was even more effective than them. Also used was Asphotida, which despite being less effective than Sylphium, was more abundant and less expensive. The seeds of Queen Anne's Lace, also known as wild carrot, saw use, and experiments have shown that they can inhibit the fetal and ovarian growth of pregnant rats. Communities of women in both North Carolina and India have been found to be consuming Queen Anne's Lace to reduce fertility. Pennyroyal, Artemisia, Myrrh, Willow, Date Palm, Pomegranate and Rue were also all used as contraceptives or abortifacients. Pennyroyal would have been effective, but it's also toxic if taken in imprecise amounts. Pomegranate's reputation as an agent of birth control can be best seen in the Greek myth of Persephone and Hades, where every pomegranate canal that Persephone eats related to a month in fall or winter, the six months of infertility. Rue has also been used as an abortifacient among the Hispanic peoples of New Mexico, and put in tea to effectively carry out the same purpose across Latin America. In the Middle Ages, Hildegard of Bingen described the use of tansy for the inducing of abortion. However, by the Renaissance period, medical texts no longer discuss plant-based abortifacients or contraceptives. There are theories as to why this was. By the 12th century, physicians trained at universities rather than in apprenticeships, and by the 14th century, guilds required you to have graduated university to practice medicine. University medicine courses focused more on medical theory than clinical practice, and the dispensing of drugs became more the occupation of the pharmacist than the physician, and whilst women had studied medicine at university in the early Middle Ages, the study had come to be dominated by men whilst gynaecology came to be dominated by midwives, as did the knowledge of abortifacient and contraceptive drugs. The communication of this gynaecological knowledge from generation to generation was interrupted as physicians distrusted the traditions of folk medicine and the women with this knowledge had nobody left to pass it on to. Eventually, the law even began to target and punish the women who held on to the knowledge of plant-based birth control, in modern times, few women have the knowledge to regulate their fertility that ancient women once largely had and passed on to each other. And speaking of crimes which women were systematically and unfairly found guilty of, let's move on to the final method of birth control potentially used in the past. Part 4. Infanticide An argument made by some historians is that, due to the population patterns of people in ancient and medieval times, and the fact that there seems to have been an unusual amount more males than females, infanticide was being regularly used as a method of controlling the size of families, as infanticide was not illegal. This is not an argument with an overwhelming amount of support from either historians or primary sources, and it seems likely that the population patterns can be explained by the use of oral plant-based contraceptives and abortifacients rather than infanticide. Part 5. Conclusion History has seen a grand deal of exercises in birth control take place alongside a raging debate on what is and is not ethical, and whilst this has varied from place to place and time to time, it seems that condom-like devices were regularly used in an attempt to prevent the spread of sexual transmitted or venereal diseases, whilst women sought to regulate their own fertility via the use of plant-based contraceptives and abortifacients. Whilst there are some attempted methods of birth control which have not been mentioned here, such as the use of crocodile dung by the ancient Egyptians, this has hopefully given you some idea of birth control in the past and where to start the research for your own specific area of interest. And if that is something you're interested in, then feel free to check out the further reading that I've put in the description, and I will see you next time.